Okay, this morning we are continuing with our discussion on the series, I Love My Church. I Love My Church. And as I said that last Sunday, I Love My Church connotes that you have a church. So one more time, turn to your neighbor on the left and on the right. Say, do you have a church? You need an answer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because some people don't have a church. Not having a church is not a good thing. Bible said we should not forsake the gathering of our, of our brothers and sisters. It also said where two or three are gathered in my name. There's something about gathering. So we should have a place that we are consistently fed. A child who suck breasts of 30 mothers will not be a healthy child. There's an experiment I talked about here some times ago. About 30 children who were given birth to. And then one of these emperors, I can't remember his name now, decided to conduct an experiment. And then these 30 children, the women they were giving birth to, they were taken away from their mothers. And were kept in a place, nice place. And women were allowed to come there, feed them, and go away. Not talking to them, not touching them. Just feed them and go away. Less than 90 days, all of them were dead. They were properly fed everything, but there was a part that the human relation, the part that the community play in the growth of a human being. And the spiritual community has a special place. I've shared here on a few occasions that I had, one of the major accidents I've had in my life was when I stayed away from church for two weeks. I don't, I'm not saying that relate to you, but when I had that accident, the Holy Ghost told me it's because you broke fellowship. I lost my first car in that accident. There's still an iron here because this hand was broke, completely broken. I have to give 500,000 to see that crest. It was in 2009 or 2010 for the hand to be fixed. Hallelujah. There's, you may not know what is happening, but because we gather unto a God, there's an illumination, there's an edification that is going on. To tell you how powerful the church is, the Antichrist cannot come now until we leave. To those who are teaching some of the things you are hearing that they will see Corona, this one, they say it's Antichrist. No. Antichrist can't meet the believers here. Go to, if you read 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, all of that is open up there. Praise God. But unfortunately, most of us too don't bother reading the Bible much. So people can bamboozle us with anything and we think. Antichrist cannot come as long as you are here. And the funny thing is, you may not even look like Christian to yourself. You know, there are some times you do some things and you'll be wondering, am I really a believer? <laughs> but if you have accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are a believer. And I've always given an, ex give an example. When, when, the disciple, when Peter was locked up in prison, and the disciples gathered and they were praying, and the road that came, and said, Peter is at the door. They say, which of the Peter? They say, it must be his ghost. What were they praying for? <laughs> but did God answer that prayer? He did. But they were praying in heavy unbelief. The church has never been perfect. But God has always done what he wanted to do. So don't judge yourself too harshly. I'm not saying you should keep messing around. No. Do your best. Perfection is on the other side of eternity. But by all means, do all the best you can. And one of the places that will help you to do that is in the church where you are committed to. It creates opportunity for accountability. Church creates opportunity for accountability. There are some things you can't wear because you are in choir. You feel one of your sisters may see you. Even though you wanted to wear, it's a help for you. Everywhere I've ever been, the moment I show up, I identify myself. I'm a Christian. So that even the day that my body is doing me somehow. <laughs> Hallelujah. I, 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 I got back on Facebook yesterday after 10 years. <laughs> I noticed I left there in 2012. <laughs> so I got, my coach said I should go back. That the, that, the, that the most active social media in the middle belt is the Facebook. And that's it. And as a pastor, that I need to be there. So I went back. And then I started scrolling down some of the things I posted in 2012. And I was wondering, I would look at some of those, I said, oh boy, you were a Christian this time. You know, I saw some of my posting. I don't know who I was talking to. I said, I, I don't miss you. I miss who I thought you were. <laughs> I was a bachelor. You know? <laughs> Hallelujah. Then I saw something else I posted. I said, uh, I said, maybe you need to eat the makeup a little bit so that you can be fine inside as you are outside. <laughs> you know, can you see some of those things? <laughs> Let not go there this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so, but I was a believer. I, at that period, I was doing tongues and all of that. 
So those some of those things and all of that. Sheba, why are you so short? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stewardship is what we are picking out of this. I love my church. Be, loving your church make you one of the ways to love your church is becoming a steward to what God is doing there. The scripture says we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Those the, the, what you have stewardship to be a steward is to serve. Is to be a servant. To be a steward is to serve. Stewardship is a critical aspect to how we live our life before God. And sometimes, unfortunately, the moment you mention the word stewardship, the church becomes uncomfortable. Because stewardship always comes with giving. It always comes with serving. So the moment you mention the word stewardship, the church becomes uncomfortable. And then I asked a question on Twitter. That if I, I said for if I pack, pass the mic around here this morning and I ask a simple question, have you ever been blessed because you gave either to God or to man before? Almost every one of us have a testimony that you gave, you either you were led or you decided to give, and you were blessed because you gave. Then why are we always uncomfortable hearing about something that blesses us? If giving bless. Why are we always uncomfortable hearing about giving? And when we're talking about giving in terms of stewardship, of, now we're talking about giving of your time, giving of your talent, and giving of your treasure. That's the area we're looking at this morning. It's unfortunate because it, it, it is the truth that for a believer to be blessed, he must give. But whenever we talk about giving, we become uncomfortable. The, the, every, every hall will become quiet. Hallelujah. It's also unfortunate because God's mandate to us to be a good steward is not so much about giving as it is about the direction of our worship. Because whatever you value, you will worship it. And whatever you worship, you value. And whatever you value, you will give in the direction of that thing or that person. You can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. And permit me, I struggle not to say this, but some, I just have to say it. Somebody put up, one of my schoolmates who is now married and pastoring, a, a lady, she's married now, she's a pastor in the UK. She posted something yesterday about something nasty that happened about a choir lady that is trending on social media at the moment. Uh, 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 about abuse in marriage and all of that. And then under her, what she posed, I commented. I said, this is one of the reasons why I take divorce cases, even though I'm a pastor. And that it offends some people. God hates mother more than he hates divorce. Because he said, whoever takes one another's life, his life must be taken. But he said he hates divorce. So on his judgment on divorce is hatred. But his judgment for murder is that the person too must be killed. So that is a little bit higher. Relationship. There are some persons that must never marry. It's a compatibility problem. As in are, I'm talking about two people who must never marry. I know one or two of such persons. Who got married and it was, thank God nobody died in that their own case. But everybody just have to go. There are some temperament and some personalities that can never cohabit. Hallelujah. And I'm not saying from the pulpit that you should divorce. But you are also not stupid. Also, and, not, and where most people make some mistakes from is before the marriage. Somebody just told you yesterday, I love you, and today he has slapped you two times. He has called you stupid. Call your father stupid. Call your mother stupid. You are not even yet engaged. If you continue, it means you are truly stupid. Praise God. And also for the guy, you just notice, you just can't stand this lady. Even though she has money, you are looking for money. She can help you rent house. But you know me and this person can't cohabit. Why should you make progress? You have heard me say in front of my wife, there's somebody I did not get married to. That my wife, after looking at the matter one day, you say, why didn't you marry this person? 
Because the person was too good for me not to marry the person. And before I have to give you a, a small CV, when I met her, she's the last born from the family of one of the biggest billionaires in the Middle Belt. She's the last born from that family. School abroad, she was 29, she was a virgin. School abroad. And plenty things at that point, the elder brother was chairman of two banks in Nigeria. Among several other things. But do you know why I didn't marry her? Physical, I didn't like her. Her size wasn't the size of women I want. That was what, that was what I did like. That's what I did marry. I did not consider any of those money or any of those things. It was in Guaripa here. And I was not the one really chasing her. She, was, she saw my picture ran from Kaduna to Abuja Street to come and meet me. Decent Christian girl. But I look at her size. We're taking a walk in Guaripa here one evening. She came to see me. We're taking a walk. I look at her size. I say, not my size be this. Don't marry, marry somebody who know God and who love you. Those are the two criteria. Anybody can make money. So that you don't go and kill yourself. Because both parties are not happy. Praise God. It's not part of my message, but because we are young people. You are looking for a wife. You are not looking for a sponsor. You are looking for a husband. You have certificate. They, you are looking for a man who is rich. They, your certificate, what will you do with it? Drop it before God and pray. The guy you are running after is a graduate too. It's God that bless. Careful to you sin. That is time and chance that happen to them all. And the time and chance can happen for you too. It will even happen for you. Because the truth is the world is round. Everybody will take his turn. That you have not gotten to your turn yet. Don't mean God has forgotten you. Don't go and kill yourself for nothing. People are confused. Marry for wrong reasons. Marry who you like. He may stay in Guagua for now. It's for a season. He will come out. And who are you trying to impress? Like some of us, you, have, you don't have money to rent a house in Guaripa. Go to where you can pay your rent and go and pay. How many people visit you in a year? You are trying to impress people. Who are you trying to impress? Huh? And if you can't marry you with Guagua, leave her. And if you are not for Guagua men, leave Guagua men alone. Look for your mighty man. But when he comes out, you will not be the one regretting that they are bossing you, bossing you where you are. Then, praise God. That's not my direction, but it's very painful. It's something that shouldn't happen. Because the other person that may end up in jail while the other person is dead. And they have four children. We worship what we value. And that's why stewardship is so important. What we give our attention to most is what, is what we need. And that, I still want to go back to this matter. And at, no matter where you are in life, you may be a single mother of four. God will give you a husband. It's God that gives husband. Don't let anybody undervalue you. Put value on yourself. Is it because the other person aborted the four children and did not have children? Is that what made the person better? Because you gave birth to your own? Every, any time you meet God, it's your morning. God can, God, have you seen people who recycle plastic? At whatever point you put your life in God's hand, he will recycle it. And give you a fresh beginning. Don't let anybody undervalue you. You are not a graduate, then the girl is forming. Look for another one. It's both ways. Marry who can marry you. And join hand in prayer. Any two can become great. When two join together, they change 10,000. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, help me. Still worship, if we were to define it, simply means to order your life in such a way that it shows everyone where your heart really is. If we are to define still worship, it will order your life. Still worship will order that when people look at you, they know who you are serving. If you see a, 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 a serious Christ embassy brother, you know. His hair is perm. There's nothing wrong with it. Praise God. If you see a deeper life brother, you know. That is what still worship look like. If you see a follower of Christ, you shouldn't struggle to identify one. Praise God. That's what still what is. It, 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 it becomes like, become like a, a witness to the public that this is who this person is. That's what still worship is about. The apostle Paul had something to say 
on this subject. So let here let us read from Apostle Paul. Philippians 4, 10 to 19. Philippians 4, 10 to 19. He said, How I praise the Lord that you are concerned, that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need. That's a strong statement. For I have learned how to be content with what I have. We we'll look at that place. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. For I can do all things. You know, I, I just have to job myself. You know this place? Almost every Christian knows this scripture. But we don't know verse 11 and 12. The strength of I can do all things is in contentment. It's in contentment. It's in contentment. He said, I can do all things because I have learned to live in abundance and to live. You know, we have, when, when the first thing I wrote on Facebook yesterday is, I said, I just got back to Facebook after 10 years. I said, but this is, the lesson I learned from this is, the fact that everybody is doing something does not mean you must do it. Every human being alive that I know is on Facebook, but I stayed away from it from ten, for 10 years. You shouldn't live your life because, no. Live based on your conviction. He said, I can, I, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength because he has learned content in verse 15. Okay, he said, even so you have done well to share with me in my present difficulty. As you know, you Philippians were the only ones who gave me financial help when I first brought you the good news. And then traveled on from Macedonia to other church, to no other church did this. Even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once. I don't say this because I want a gift from you. Rather, I want you to receive a reward for your kindness. As at the moment, I have all I need and more. I am generously supplied with the gift you sent with Epaphroditus. They are sweet smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. Even though it was sent to Paul, it's acceptable to God because Paul is God's servant. 19. And this same God who take care of me will supply all your needs. And not that scripture again, if you tell that every Christian on earth know. But we also, don't, we also don't know verse 16 to 18. The basis upon which God will supply all their needs was because they gave to the apostle. He was saying, my God will supply. He was saying, my God will supply. So why is this idea of stewardship important to our series about loving your church? As I have said at the beginning, your stewardship shows what you serve. It shows what is valued to you. You don't, don't this used to be a checkbook. Now, if you pick your phone and you look at your debit alert, it shows what you value. It shows who you serve. Your debit alert shows who you serve. It, 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 every, every, it, everyone around you will know because it's an unconscious thing. It comes out, you know, just like that. And the, everyone, that, the people who you worship with in your church will know who, st who steward you are. The, the, the people in your neighborhood, your family members, your friends, and your community know who steward you are. And if we claim to be Christians... It should be obvious to everyone around us. If we say we love our church, Grace Breed, there must be some level of service and sacrifice, some value that we place on Grace Breed to a certain that people will look at this person and say, This person is a, a member of Grace Breed. This, you know, it, 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 some of the things I have learned over in some churches, I pray that doesn't happen in Grace Breed. In some churches, you can't call their pastor's name wrongly. Some may even slap you. But the other people, they will be the one to bring up their pastor's name in gossip. 
Some, why some churches value their leaders, value their church. Some churches don't. And some church members don't. Part of this teaching is you can't say you love your church and people criticize your church. You saw what uh, the American actor did. They talk about his wife the way he didn't like it. He went off. Hallelujah. They shouldn't, I've said it here before, I said if I'm working with you and you're a member of Grace Bridge and then some teenagers within your age bracket, talk to me anyhow. If you don't slap him, I'll suspect you. But if you slap him, I'll hold you. I'll say, ah, you're a Christian, you don't do that. You don't do that. But by then you have slapped already. Yeah, we, we can settle with our God later. Pr praise God. Those are some things that ah, you now stay somewhere. People are, are insulting your church. They are talking about the church. Where you go to, the God that you, you don't really value him. And that means the day you are being insulted, God will be quiet. He said, those that honor me, I will honor. I've said it here before. Glory, I, have, I can't remember. I think I fought last in 1985. Some of us were not born. That was the first and the last time I remember that I fought with someone. I'm not I'm a peace-loving person. I don't fight. I hardly quarrel. But anybody that I have issue with my family were people who spoke to my mom the way I didn't like it. Not even fight. You can't talk to my mom in a certain way. I will forgive you, but I won't cast my pearls before swine. You, won't have, you will never have my attention again for the rest of my life. Praise God. I was talking, to, talking with someone recently and then a pastor that I admire, that I value, he said something about the person. I stopped the conversation as if I was shocked by an electric uh, whatever. And the person was surprised. I thought, no. You don't talk to this person like this when I'm present. He's my pastor. You don't. Praise God. Because what you don't value won't bless you. Praise God. You know, that's why even in submission, that's why I say don't marry somebody who you don't like but on both ways. Because if you don't honor a man, like, like I was telling my, one of my friends yesterday, we were talking, and I said something, in between our Jesus, I said something about a woman who was, who, was married, who, who was married to a pastor and was believing God to get pregnant and wasn't getting pregnant. And other people were coming to church and getting pregnant. And then until one day she came to the realization that she treat her husband both at home and in church like husband. She forgot the pastor part of the man's life. And then one day after service like this, she knelt to them and said, pray for me. And not quite weeks, she got pregnant. Honor. If honor is absent, some things you will never see them. That, why are we saying this? If you come to Grace Bridge, value here. You don't need to run from pillar to post. We share some testimony towards the end of this sermon. Some drastic things have happened in this place. Because I don't come into the church through the back with my back. <laughs> you know, that's what some of us grew up saying. I'll just come in with my back. You know, three people will carry my Bible. Because I don't do that, does not mean God is not here. Praise God. God is with us. Drastic things, major things. But if you don't have that understanding, you will come here and struggle. Like, for example, if you are in this house, and, okay, let, let's just do this, this thing. If the job or the business you are doing now, you got it in Grace Breed, stand up. The job you are doing now, you, did, you got it after you came to Grace Breed. Stand up. This number is even still less. It, it, sit down, have your seat. One of the things that is very easy in this house is getting a job. I observed it. I saw it. And not roadside jobs. So. Yeah, good jobs. Without connection, without misbehaving. Among several other things. Praise God. So, it, 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 a lot of things happen here, but because we don't shout about it. You know, people just come and, mm, that place, let's go now. No, God is with us. We have no business coming here if God didn't call us. Hallelujah. But somehow, for some reason, we need to say some of these things so that we look at it and then be able to take advantage of where we are. The idea of stewardship is how we take God seriously. It's how we take the things of God seriously. The first reason why this is important is because our stewardship reveals our heart. Our stewardship reveals our heart. 
it, it, uh, let's look at that verse 10 of Philippians. That we okay, that's what is up. He said, the, oh, Yes, he said, How I pray the Lord that you are concerned about me. He said, I know you have always been. How did he know? Because they were given to him. Because they were given to him. He, 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 what we serve, what we give, what we commit, with the sacrifice we make, shows what is in our heart. She reveals where our heart is focused on. Hallelujah. One of the things that blessed Apostle Paul about the Philippian church is that he knew how much they all love him and his ministry. He knew that they, that, that they would pray for him. He knew that, they, but, but that giving, because the prayer, I was thinking yesterday night, or was it this morning? You know, most times people say, I'll pray for you, they don't pray. That's why you must have a prayer life. It was this morning I was, I was having my bath, I thought of that thing. Most times people say, I'll pray for you, they don't. It's good to have your personal prayer life. Speak over your life from time to time. Don't wait for people to speak over you. Praise God. Maybe that's for somebody. It, 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 Paul wasn't so much blessed by the fact that they were rich and could do this. As a matter of fact, he said even out of their lack, they were given. There were other churches that Paul, that Paul planted who were not who, who were more wealthy than the Philippian church, but they did not care about him. But he knows this will care out of what they were giving. That's why he said, even yet out of your poverty, you gave. You know, it, it, and how were they doing it? For example, the, the, like the poor people. Now we're talking about service, time, talent, and treasure. Maybe there's a poor man in the Philippian church who doesn't have anything to give to Apostle Paul. He may decide to send one of his sons. You know, those days, why people marry wife and give birth to plenty of children? You know, it was like the attractor. Children were tractors now. They helped for mechanized family in those days. You know, so a man who, probably a farmer who is poor, who needs the service of his son, may decide to release one of them as a sacrifice to say, go help Apostle Paul this season. Paul could see it, could feel it. Maybe a widow who is trying to knit a, a, a blanket or something for her grandchild. After knitting it, you feel, wow. Where Apostle Paul is now, probably there's a lot of code there. Rather than giving it to the child as a souvenir, he, he, he sent it to Apostle Paul as an instrument of ministry. Those things matter a lot to Paul. Maybe a craftsman, maybe, maybe a tent maker like him, after making tent, the money that he was paid, he take a part of it and sent to Apostle Paul for ministry. Those were the things that Paul was talking about. These people use what God had given them to make sure that the gospel of Christ prosper. What God has given them, they make sure that it is of service to the gospel. It's not about how much you can give. It's about the heart behind it. But when we said about the heart behind it, it's not when, that, when you have so much, you give so small. But God also sees the heart. But if you give what you have based on your capacity, Bible says it's God that gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So he knows from where you are given from. And, and there's a beautiful scripture in Mark. You know, <coughs> to tell us that Jesus was concerned about Jesus is concerned about what we give. In Mark 12, Jesus was seated by the offering basket. That was when she saw, he saw what that widow gave. He was close to the basket. So he saw what the widow gave. And then let's make that widow's offering personal this morning. That you know, some of us, out of your hundred thousand, you want to give somebody five thousand. You say, My widow's might. That is not your widow's might, too. <laughs> your widow's might is actually the hundred thousand. It's all. That's all the woman had. And in making it personal this morning, what that woman did is let's put it this way. You are coming to church this morning. You left home. All the money in your pocket as you are seated down here is five hundred naira. And your account balance is zero. And then why the offering basket? And then you have no money to pay transport to work, to work tomorrow. That 500 naira is home and abroad. And then as the ushers are passing the offering basket round, the Holy Spirit said, drop that money in the offering basket. At that point, whether you drop it or not is what will prove who still are you. Who do you serve? If it's God you serve and it's the Holy Ghost you had, you will drop it. You may be crying, but you will drop it. 
But if it's not God you serve, if you came to church because you noticed some fine girls used to show up here. <laughs> Hallelujah. It, because it's easy to read that story and not put life to it. And not put life to it. A few persons have done it in the past. It's actually not always an easy thing to do. No lunch tomorrow. Your brain, you know, you know, you know survival instinct is the most powerful instinct in man. Your survival instinct will jump up. Oh boy, are you stupid? What is wrong with you? Not knowing that this 500 naira in your pocket can actually disappear before you get to the gate. And then you begin to ask the same God. Where do I go from here? You know, there's a tribe in Nigeria that if they want to marry, they make sure the sister must get pregnant first before wedding so that they don't marry a woman who will not give birth. I said they have forgotten that God can cause the stomach to swell up. And after the wedding, they think go back. It's, it's not wisdom. Anything that is not done by faith or in faith in this kingdom is sin. It's sin. Hallelujah. It, it, the, the second thing about stewardship, that we, talking about the next point, stewardship starts with contentment. That was where I jumped on my jump forward earlier. Stewardship starts with contentment. To be able to give. God, nobody really have enough. I was reading, I was reading, I was watching a documentary about John D. Rockefeller. They are very American first known as a millionaire or billionaire in dollars. I was listening in his documentary. They asked him, how much money is enough? He said, a little more. Did you hear that? The richest man on earth. They asked him, how much money is enough? He said, a little more. So it means money can never be enough. Whatever you own can never be enough. But being able to give, you know, has to come from the part that you are satisfied. You are not satisfied, you are contented with what God has given you. And then a story of an ambitious, very ambitious young man jumped at me. A young man, a church boy, went to his pastor and asked the pastor to pray that God bless him. And that when God bless him, that as God bless him, that he will give 10% of whatever God give him, as he was already given. At that stage in his life, he was earning 40,000 monthly and was paying tight 4,000 naira. So he asked the pastor to, that God will bless him so that the tight, his money can increase so that his tight can be bigger. And the pastor prayed and then they agree with God, you know, that as he does that, as God bless him, he will give the money and all of that. And not too many years after, God bless him so much that the 40,000 salary before became his tight. So he started making 400k a month. And then at that point, he realized that that agreement with God is costly. How can he be giving 40,000 every month? So he came back to the pastor and said, Pastor, can you pray to this God? Let him release me from this agreement. And pastor said, no, that is difficult. But pastor said, there's a way to do it. Let's pray that God will bring you back to 40,000 monthly. Since you don't struggle to pay 4,000 naira tight. And what I just said now, explain some of the things that some of us go through. Because God knows the heart. They know that if they take you beyond this level, you go marry a second wife. The only reason you have not married a second wife it's because you can't rent a two-bedroom. So they keep you in the room and parlor for a very long time until you grow. Hallelujah. They say this purity, purity you are claiming as a single person is because it's the care you are carrying. That if they dare give you one small Corolla now, Baripa go no. It, this may be funny. But, at, but most time, this is what keeps people... I'm a father. I told you guys before, when my, when my son was how old? Was he two years old? We we're going to the salon to go cut his hair. And then he peep his hair from the back. He said, Daddy, can someone drive this your car? Do you know who is the somebody? It's him. <laughs> Funny enough, that period, we had an extra car in the house. 
And a few days before that, I was actually wishing that he was old enough so that he can be driving a car. But no matter how I wish or how I love him, two years, where is he driving to? Praise is the same thing with God because God loves us. There are some things you know. That's why we pray about capacity in this house. I remembered when we, you know, we were doing fellowship in school, fire, fire, fire. I was talking with one of my benefactors. You know, and then he looked at me and, and my friend. He just laughed. He said, oh, this is your holiness that you are forming. He said, he said, until you can buy a car for a lady and it won't touch your account balance. It will, you will remember. Or you can tell her, go to the UK. Go to one of the best hotels in London. Wait for me. I'm coming. And for the next three weeks, you have not gone there yet. The money is being spent and you are not feeling it. He said, and you are not doing it. He said, that's when we will know that you are a Christian. But funny enough, you don't need to rise to that level. At your level now, there are some things you have capacity to do. The ability to deny yourself of doing those things is what makes you, that's how you prove to yourself. You know, there are some things you do to prove to yourself that I'm not a Christian. Hallelujah. If you have never done anything like that, try and do one. There are some things you do. I told her several times that the day I gave my old car, I knew I was born again. Praise God. There are some things you do that you come, you say, Kai, I'm born. <laughs> Hallelujah. You just know that you heard God. And, and to, just the way that pastor said, take that man back to status quo. Some of us, you, you, know, you notice you are rising and falling. Maybe you need to ask the Holy Ghost. Because maybe when you rise, the portion of the blessing that belong to God, you now use it to service your excesses. But God grant us understanding this morning in the name of Jesus. Let me summarize what the Christian faith is this morning. Christianity is not just about church attendance. Christianity is not just about how much we give. Christianity is not even too much about how we treat others or treat ourselves. But if, if you are a Christian, then everything about you is Jesus. If you are a Christian, Apostle Paul said, in life, in death, in eating, in drinking, Christ. Christ. He, he, until you get to that place, that some things God won't commit to your hand. If in your, you notice that you don't struggle with God. You don't struggle with God. We were talking with a couple how many days ago. He said, my husband said that you don't wear eyelash. And she dropped it off. Praise God. You remember me saying last Sunday, I told my wife, no African magic. She too said, eh, no premiership. Both of us drop up. Until we get to that place with God, that everything about you, you don't struggle with God over anything. It becomes beautiful to be a Christian. Become beautiful to be a Christian. And at that point, that's where the Bible says, against such there's no law. That is the fruit of the Spirit. It, it, those are the things, those contentment, those kindness, those gentleness, those obedience, you, it becomes possible, impossible for the devil to find anything in you. Hallelujah. It also becomes impossible to make wrong choices. Because if your choices are determined by God, not your flesh, and most of the time, when they come to the flag, the things that we are choosing, those things do they last. Have you noticed? As I said, that going back to Facebook yesterday after 10 years, some of my classmates, I can't recognize them again. Those who were slim 16 in my class those days, I saw a few of them yesterday. I was wondering what happened. Their grammar has resurrected. Is that the, the one on Facebook? Some of the things that people were breaking their head about that time. Praise God. And unfortunately, there's no amount of exercise that will handle it when it comes to a certain age. The expression of our faith is the practical outworking we call still worship. The expression of our faith is the practical outworking that we call still worship. The express, I think it was, it was Pastor Deboe who said he, there was this jeep that he loved almost like a child. And then he went to God one day asking for higher anointing. And God said, give me that jeep. He said, now wow. He said, but he gave. Praise God. 
professor, he was staying in, a, in a, he keeps talking about well, that one room in motion. Abi? The professor from the quarters. He was on his way to become the youngest VC in West Africa. That was his dream before God showed up. And then he had to leave the quarter when it was time for when he became overseer and needed to do full time. One room in Mushi. But it was in that one room that he was praying that God had begged, give me two bedrooms. I have a family. And God said, I won't give you two bedrooms. I will build you a city. Now, for those who have been to the Redeem Camp, you will know that God actually built him a city. And God is not a respecter of person. Who do you serve? I've said it here before that out of personal fellowship in school, something came out of me that to be relevant in life, he said that you serve God or you serve men. You must serve someone. You must serve someone. How are we ordering our life to give the most glory to the one who gave it all to be with us? The sacrifice that Christ paid, we won't understand it on this side of eternity. But one of the things that help you to understand it a little is when you see people get born again and their life changed. I was privileged to be a student pastor on campus. You know student pastor? You go to canteen with everybody on adult jam food. You cook a concussion in the hotel, everybody jam it. And then you get to the fellowship and you lay hand on someone. And you pray for someone. And then the person gets healed. The person gets delivered. Missing result is found. School fees that couldn't pay, paid. You know, at that point, you know that this thing is not because of you. Somebody paid for this thing. Somebody paid for this thing. And the same thing it is at every level of life and destiny. How are you treating the sacrifice that Christ made? You know, I say, I think one of the problems we have with being proper steward of time, talent, or treasure is that we think that what we give in these three areas just disappears. I talk about this a little bit in the first service. You know, when we give these days, is to give now, receive tomorrow. Give now, receive tomorrow. Eh, we think it's uh, MMMMMM. You know, and all of that. But Christianity giving is beyond here. There's, an et- that, there's a heaven. There's an eternity. That's what Apostle Paul was saying. That He said, he said it's something is, a reward is waiting. Something is being entered into your account in heaven. There's an account in heaven for a believer. And I gave an example in the first service. I said, if there's nothing in heaven, why should someone like Pastor Adeboye, 80 years old, still be with, winning soul, running from city to city? What is he looking for? How much money does he need anymore to, to, for, for the remaining years he has to spend on earth? Hallelujah. There's something beyond. What was Rehan Bonke looking for? That he'll collect one million, somebody will sponsor with one million dollar private jet, he will come and stand in the hot sun of Africa, shouting. What was he looking for? There's something on the other side. And for anyone who believes in Christ, anyone who is a Christian here this morning, it's assumed that you believe that there's eternity. And if there's eternity, there are crowns also in heaven. Praise God. So the service we render here, there's another side to it. But because these days as pastors, we don't even talk about it anymore. You know, because of the level of hunger at the moment, people don't even want to talk about heaven again. Yeah, because people have not even eaten, you are talking heaven. Praise God. But there's a heaven. You know, Paul, Paul said, credited to your account. Not that I desire your gift. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. The Bible tells us that nothing we do for the Lord will ever be in vain. God sees to it by keeping track of everything we do for him. It was Peter who was asking Jesus. He said, we have left all and follow you. He said, what are we going to get? He said, here on earth, 100%. Also in heaven, 100%. He said, but with persecution. Hallelujah. So God, God is a good steward of everything that is given to him. Of every sacrifice we make, make in his name. God is credited an account for you. In it will be everything you stewarded to increase his kingdom on earth. And and, bring, and then bringing us back to the central trust of this message series, I love my church. Loving your church will be seen in how you use your time in relation to the church. If you love your church, how you spend your time 
a portion of it will, will reflect that you truly love your church. Loving your church will be seen in how you use your talent and your gifting to benefit or to profit the church. If you love your church and you are gifted in the area that your church needs, you, you, you will not actually be comfortable. Praise God. You won't be comfortable sitting in church and then the area that you are good is suffering. A part of you will not be happy. Having been a church, a, an usher in church for like 13 years of my life or 14 years. I was an usher for like 14 years. Any church I go to and the ushering department is not doing well. There's a part of me that shrink, that feel bad about it. Because it's something I've gone through seminars, through training and all of that. Praise God. It, it's the same thing. Loving your church will be seen in how you use your treasure, your finances to further God's kingdom. In, if you can't you can't have the money and then the church is asking for money and you know who gave you this money and then you sit there comfortably it means you are not yet a steward in the house of god it means you don't really love your church praise god and finally we must never forget what do you have that you have not received even the time that you have remember the the man who built bands they said today your soul is required of you so it means that time was given. The person who gave it took it back. Your time, your talent, your treasure, your money is a gift. You must know that there is a purpose in the mind of the giver. When somebody gives a gift, there's a purpose in his mind. Especially God. He told, he told Moses, he said, I have anointed a holy herb and what is the name of the other one? A Bezalil. In craftsmanship, what was the purpose? That their, 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 their expertise would be used in building the temple. Even the, the, the dollar they collected from Egypt, it was collected in the wilderness to build the temple. So whenever God gave, all the primary purpose in the mind of God, when he gave you something, or when he gives you something, is that it will be used to prosper his kingdom here on earth. The gift you have, the talent you have, the treasure you have, the primary purpose it will touch you like a tap conducting water but the primary purpose is that god will be glorified is that something somehow in the house of god will be lifted because you have you prospered because you bless remember when we we're talking about some of the list earlier in the first service the 2.5 billion dollar we need for generator what i say casually was someone will pay that tithe very soon because it has happened here before we need that money to pay rent and we prayed. And bam, somebody made 25 million. Here, then we were still less than one year. And then the person paid title of 2.5 million. But God will not give that kind of money to someone who he knows will not give it to his house. Hallelujah. So this morning, set your heart a little bit. What do you do with what God has blessed you with? What do you do with what God has blessed you with?